Be in 515, we'll uh, call the May 30th, 2023 Economic Development Committee to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Roll call has been taken. Uh, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda? Second. We have a motion by April, second by um, Dave. Uh, is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Is there any public comment? Did I miss that one? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, minutes are in your packet. Um, has everyone had a chance to read their minutes? Is there any discussion on the minutes? Otherwise, I look for a motion. Make a motion to approve the minutes of the April 25th, 2023 meeting. Second. We got a motion by John, second by Hans to approve the minutes. For April 25th, 2023. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Back to public comment. <laughs> <laughs> no public comment at this time. We're going to move on to immigrants' impact on dairy farming presented by the New London FFA. So I can jump in from here. Um, as we talked about at our last meeting, I've had some communications with Crystal Retzloff, um, one of the teachers at uh, New London High School. Um, and there is a presentation today by some FFA students um, on what we got on the agenda, Immigrants Impact on Dairy Farming presented by the FFA group. So if you guys want to come up, okay. yes, right. up, come on down. And then I have one microphone. Um, just in front of John and Bob there on the floor, if you want to grab that. I have another microphone up here. And then we'll just pass the microphones back and forth so we capture it on Zoom. And then if you guys wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves too. <laughs> Hi, I'm Evan Retzloff. Um, I'm Hannah Gorman. I'm a junior. I'm Heidi Weiland. My name is Carolyn Backus. And I'm Jake Flocker. All right, here we go. My name is Heidi, and I am a student from the New London FFA chapter. Today, I'm here to get more information about immigrant workers in the dairy industry. Here's what I know already. The dairy industry is a key factor for Wisconsin, dating back all the way to the 1800s. Wisconsin now milks over 2.74 billion pounds monthly, earning them the second spot in the nation for production. On average, that's 209 cows per farm. If farmers milk two to three times a day, plus working in the fields and working on machinery, who is helping the farmer? Finding employees is challenging across the nation and in Wisconsin. Farms have to hire teenagers and immigrant workers just to get the job done. 5% of Wisconsin's population consists of foreign and immigrant people. Immigrants are used in all aspects of today's society like construction, fabrication, and farming. Today, we have an agricultural panel that is going to discuss the pros and cons to each side. Could the panelists please step forward and introduce themselves? Good evening, I am Shelly Van Hoover. I am the Agriculture Specialist for the Department of Homeland Security. My job is to ensure agriculture success in America. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maria and I'm from Jalisco, Mexico. Today, I'll be talking to you a little bit about my experience as an immigrant worker in the Wisconsin dairy industry. Hi, I am Jim Owens and I am a large Wisconsin dairy farmer that milks 1500 cows regularly. Hello, I'm Steve Hoyer, and I'm here today to tell you about how hiring immigrant workers can cause harm to many small-scale farmers such as myself. Thank you, panelists, for being here today in order to discuss immigrant workers in the Wisconsin dairy industry. I hope to learn a lot from everyone in order to improve my LDE project on this topic. I would first like to begin by discussing the agriculture impacts that are made from hiring immigrant workers. The, I would like to discuss 
the areas in place, the laws that are in place that are being created, as well as the issues that can come from hiring immigrant workers. The first law I would like to discuss is the H-2A. That law is a joke. It doesn't help the dairy industry at all. It only helps those who need seasonal help, which is not the dairy industry. We need workers year round. Well, this is how I started my journey to becoming a U.S. citizen. I worked here for short periods of time using this program before I was able to become a legal citizen here. After my time in the H-2A program, I had gone through all the steps to becoming legal here and came, to my came here with my family to start a life. How does the H-2A work? Well, Heidi, to acquire the H-2A, a farmer applies to the Department's Employment and Training Administration for an immigrant to hire for only a season. The farmer must provide that there is no one else willing to be hired for this position or, or are they available to be used for this position. The workers must be, must be provided with housing, transportation, and a set pay rate based on the location of the farm. This permit can be allocated within 75 days, or if it is a dire emergency, it can be required acquired in 44 days. Ha! There's no way that I could afford to pay for the transportation and housing. Workers are needed immediately, not in 75 days, especially if it's an emergency. Well, she just said that it can be acquired in 44 days if it is an emergency. Right now, there's currently a bill that is being discussed in Congress. It is called the H.R. 1603, or Farm Workforce Modernization Act. This act will simplify the H-2A by lessening the amount of paperwork needed to hire an immigrant worker. It will also make it so it's not just seasonal workers, but those for year-round work. It gives the immigrants a chance to get a five-year CAW, also known as temporary residency. The H-2A doesn't help dairy farmers, but the H.R. 1603 will help the dairy farmers in the Wisconsin industry because they can hire them for more than just a season. The only problem that comes from the H.R. 1603, it does not give these immigrants full legal permanent status. Without this reform, I cannot continue because I need workers for more than just a season. Immigrant workers want to work full time at an eight hour workday, 40 hours a week or more. This is great for me because I milk three times a day and can't afford to rely on teenagers who have extracurricular activities at school and can only work certain days of the week. Most other local workers are not willing to work a third shift. I also have the opportunity of working overtime, which is what some immigrants want because they're used to working over eight hours in their home country. And certain seasons, especially during harvest, is where I need my workers to work overtime. Immigrant workers tend to work hard because of their culture. In Latin America, a person must work hard to provide for their family every day. Immigrant workers usually have a motive of producing money to provide for their family back home, which also creates the need to work hard in the workplace. Hold on, the American unemployment rate is at 3.4%. Americans do want to work, they just aren't working in the dairy industry. But immigrants also work for a cheaper price compared to your normal American citizen. According to National Equity Atlas, the average American citizen of the U.S. works for $25 per hour to provide for their expenses as a homeowner and a family member. And I cannot afford to pay that. Whereas I can pay a non-citizen immigrant worker legally $17.34, which is a lot cheaper. But how does the government ensure that immigrant workers are getting paid the appropriate amount of money? Well, there is a way to make sure that farmers are paying these immigrants the, set, the right amount. It is the adverse effect wage rate. It ensures that farmers are paying the immigrants the same amount as a U.S. born citizen. The U.S. Department of Labor sets the yearly wage. Well, I'm a citizen of the United States, so I am making the $25 an hour, but that is not the case for many immigrant workers in the dairy industry. Over 80% of all immigrants in the Wisconsin dairy industry are undocumented, so this law does not help them. I have experience with some undocumented immigrants being paid much lower than the $17.34 an hour, which because they are undocumented. Most of the time, illegal, undocumented immigrants are barely scraping by with a wage that is not livable, even though their work is equivalent to anyone else's. Immigrant workers hurt me and many other small farmers. We don't need all these workers, but the large-scale farmers do. Small-scale farm life differs immensely from the life of a large-scale farmer. I only have 150 dairy cattle with a step-up parlor with 12 stalls. 
I only milk twice a day versus the three times a day that most large farmers do. I milk in the early mornings with the help of my kids before they leave from school. And then in the afternoons when they're home from school, I don't need this extra help, nor can I afford it because I don't have the extra hours that these immigrant workers want. So if they're not going to want to work for me, who are they want to go, who are they going to want to go work for the large scale farmers? This just ends up putting my farm out of business because it competitively forces me to expand my farm. Mr. Owens, how is your farm different from Mr. Hoyer's? I milk three times a day at 3 a.m., 11 a.m., and 7 p.m. At each milking, I need one pusher and four milkers to get the entire herd milked in approximately seven hours in a double 20 parlor. At minimum, I need at least 10 full-time workers that work every other milking every day, working uh, approximately 65 to 70 hours a week just to milk the cows. That doesn't include the amount of people I need to manage the herd. Most US born citizens do not want to work that much. They would rather work in an office, eight hours a day, five days a week. The majority of my workers are immigrants because of the long hours. Heidi, there's a rising saying, get big or get out. I'd be forced to expand my farm, which would be impossible for me. I'm already struggling as it is. Immigrant workers will cause small scale farmers to be forced to either become large scale farmers or find different means of making money. Also, many small scale farmers don't have ways of working around the language barrier that exists when hiring immigrant workers. Well, most immigrant workers are bilingual or are willing to earn the lang English language. At the farm I work at, when a new immigrant comes in that is not the best at English, Others help them in order for them to learn the English language in order to communicate better. So this is not as big as a problem as it may seem. Sure, this causes large scale farmers to be able to hire them, pay them cheaper wages than they should be, and communicate with them through other employees or other means of communication. But this still further harms small scale farmers. Also, if these immigrants are here illegally, then according to Wisconsin law, they're not allowed to get their driver's license. This started in 2006 and still is in force today. These immigrant workers are obviously most likely going to drive to and from work. So why would I want to put my small family farm at more risk by hiring employees who are potentially illegally getting to and from work? It just makes more sense to hire local kids if I even need to hire workers. I have friends that would love to work on a farm. Mr. Owens, do you have any teenagers work, teenage workers on your farm? No, no, I do not because they can't work full time. I milk year round, but don't need employees to help. I usually only need employees during certain seasons and periods of time, such as the planting and harvesting season. And it still will be easier logistically for me to hire local kids or teenagers instead of immigrant workers. So Heidi, if your friends still need a job and want to work at a family farm, send them over to the Hoyer family farm. I never thought there were so many differences between small farms and large farms. I thought they could all be on the same page. Maria, could you tell us more about your perspective on how you got to where you are today? Sure. First of all, I want to address some of the stereotypes that immigrant workers like me face. Contrary to popular belief, we're not all criminals or freeloaders. We're not here to take your jobs or your benefits. We're here because we want a better life for ourselves and our families. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my culture. Mexico is a beautiful country with a rich history and vibrant culture. We're known for our delicious foods, our colorful art, and our lively music. We are proud people who value family, community, and hard work. I want to tell you a little bit about my story and why I came to America. As a legal Mexican immigrant, I came to America for many reasons. I was drawn to the idea of a better life with more opportunities and more freedom. I wanted to be able to work hard and make a good living for myself and my family. I also want to be able to give my children a better education in order for them to succeed in life, a better chance to succeed than I had as a kid in Mexico. When I came over here to America, I did so legally. Prior to coming here, I went through the proper channels, filled out the necessary paperwork, and waited patiently for my green card to be approved. It wasn't easy, and it took a lot of effort, but I knew that it was the right thing to do. I want to come to America and contribute to society in a positive way. And I knew that I couldn't do that if I came here illegally. Over the years, I've worked hard and built a life here with my family. As a legal immigrant, I know that I have the responsibility to follow the laws of America. I also know that there are many people who come to America illegally, and I understand why they do it. They do it for the same reasons I came to America, to make a better life for themselves and their families. So it is important to understand that illegal immigrants are not dangerous or bad. They're just like anyone else. 
The United States citizens are very thankful that you came to the United States the legal way. But the problems that can arise from hiring immigrants on dairy farms is that these immigrants can say that they are legal, but it can turn out that they actually are undocumented. And this can ruin our Wisconsin dairy farming industry because they could end up losing their farms based on that immigrant not having the proper requirements to be a citizen. But isn't there a program called E-Verify for farmers to make sure immigrant workers are legal? Exactly, Heidi. The farmer I work for had me sign up for this. Yeah, I use it too. The program shows that there are ways to check the legal status of immigrant workers to avoid legal issues. So this program eliminates the problem. With that, I would like to say that I believe the best way to make a life here in America is to do so legally by following the rules and working hard. And I hope that others will follow by my example and come to America the right way. That was such a heartwarming story. It's great to see the immigrant workers side. As you can see, hiring immigrant workers is a very controversial issue. I'm so excited to use this information for my LDE project. These are the pros that stuck out to me. One, costs and availability of immigrant workers. Two, it benefits large farms with labor force. Three, it's making a better living for immigrant workers and their families. The cons include costs and availability of native workers. Two, the legal process is time consuming and inefficient. And three, the laws in place don't always catch the undocumented immigrant workers. I learned a tremendous amount of information today. This is clearly a never ending situation. Thank you panel for all your information and time to better myself for my project. Thank you. Amazing, you guys did great. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions for us? Nope. I have a question. So you talk about the H-2A and emergency exceptions. What is classified as an emergency under the H-2A? An emergency under the H-2A would be considered, say that the immigrant that is wanting to be hired for this position is under stress at home, say they are being threatened to be killed or any other emergencies happening towards them, towards their safety, then the process would be sped up so that they could come to America more quickly so that they could have also, another thing with the emergency situation for the H-2A program is if there's nobody to harvest, like the vegetables, nobody to provide um, their work for the farmer, there would be the H an emergency H-2A, which would be the 44 days you would get the um, immigrant worker on your farm because you might not have anyone else to harvest your vegetables, whatever it is you want to do. Else? Is the minimum wage any different for an immigrant than it is for, say, an American worker? Uh, yes. For a non-citizen worker, it is $17.34. Yeah. And then, like Evan said before, the one for of age, like over 18 people, would be, be $25 an hour. But obviously, not every immigrant worker is being paid the $17.34 an hour because many are undocumented, so like nobody knows what they're being paid. So it's just kind of an unknown. So that's a different minimum wage than like restaurants. It's a farm yeah. worker minimum yeah. wage. Okay. Is there any resources that uh, can hook uh, the farmer with uh, immigrants? Is there, I mean, I'm sure they're not on Indeed. <laughs> well, I think the one you're thinking about is a program that allows like the farmer to see their like employees like way of living back in their home country but mostly the resources to get the like the farmer with the employee is basically like the h2a program and then possibly the hr 16 yes if that's passed yeah that's basically like the main things otherwise there's like also not, other immigrants yeah a lot happens with that with like the community of like the immigrant workers and because obviously here in New London, like I've experienced with immigrant workers and there's definitely like a community. They're telling where the jobs are, like who to go work for and everything like that. I'm sure the word of mouth takes care of that a lot. Yes, you know, which definitely. ones, are, which ones that are nicer, ones that work for, you know, how, how that is. There are lots of times where they bring up their whole family and the whole family will just work at one, dairy one farm place. Together. Yeah. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for that presentation. That was really awesome. Good job. Thank you for your time. Yeah, you want me to just come Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate you guys. I listened, I listened to uh, via Zoom on the way here, and um, I couldn't tell that you guys are reading from scripts. <laughs> it was very, very, Good. very decent. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So moving forward, if there's any other, and we love interacting with the school. This is a great opportunity for the city and the school to kind of um, collaborate. If there's any other, you know, um, programs or any other um, student or teachers that are willing to come into our committees like economic development or things like that definitely reach out and let us know because this is this is really cool thank you again for having us i appreciate your time thank you thank you have a good night. okay moving on with the agenda we have a presentation by or of the new london tourism efforts people you can grab that little clicker that's in front of hans this one yep and that should this forward and drive I'll, I'll turn it on the side. Uh, there's a on oh, button. The on button that would help. <laughs> there you go. Okay. All right. So um, I had shared with uh, Tim that I wanted to share with the committee a little bit more about um, the tourism efforts done in the city of New London. So I'm going to kind of explain um, two separate umbrellas of tourism um, under. Is it sharing? Now it is. Yep. Okay. Two separate um, of umbrellas of tourism done by the Chamber of Commerce and also the Tourism Commission. Now it's not clicking. I'll try it. Ooh, it's all scrunched on there. But as you can see, um, I had mentioned tourism under the um, under the chamber. Um, in the city of New London, we're considered the tourism entity. So when you go over to Wapeka, they have a separate, um, uh, not entity, but like a separate bureau, like a tourism bureau that's not run by the chamber. So it's completely separate. But in the city of New London, um, chamber tourism is run by the Chamber of Commerce. So we actually have a staff that's working towards to promote tourism. And then there's also the Tourism Commission, which comes with a state statute, a city ordinance is applied to that. Um, we have commissioners that are appointed by the mayor and there's room tax dollars that are approved. So there's two separate umbrellas of tourism. So underneath um, the umbrella of the Chamber of Commerce, we have four different focuses. I'm sorry, this I don't know what happened with my PowerPoint. Different computers kind of yeah, look at it, things differently. So. Kind of threw it all off. Yep. So we obviously have our, our investors, our member businesses, 265 members um, of businesses and organizations. And our vision is to create value for each one of those members and make sure that we're promoting them and activating them. Um, and then underneath that also is economic development. So we are always trying to identify best practices, um, build rural prosperity and community pride. Um, we are part of that Connect Communities program and driving economic development. And then tourism. So we are the one-stop shop and resource hub for uh, the city of New London, um, promoting our history and our vibrant um, city. And then lastly, workforce support. So we are constantly trying to provide different uh, workforce um, employment programs that help connect employers and job seekers in the workforce. So tourism efforts, um, and this is under the Chamber of Commerce. We have a committed employee. India Burkhan is hired to work strictly on tourism. She's also marketing different things under the tourism, but the majority of her time is spent marketing tourism. So um, she's our welcome, our, our face of, of New London, welcoming guests to New London. And with Marketing New London, we have a tourism Facebook, a tourism Instagram. And then am I able to click on that tourism website? Um, I should be able to. So if you can kind of drive here for me. Mm -hmm. We updated the tourism website in 2018. When I came to the chamber, the two things I wanted to update were the tourism website and the chamber website. So there's two websites that we host and maintain. The tourism website, um, if you can kind of scroll down, emphasizes, keep going. Planning a trip to New London. So we emphasize our rivers um, and how to use them year round. If you wanna go down a little bit more, visiting our historic downtown, 
staying the night in New London, and then dining with us. And then if you could go back up, Chad, to the top tabs, go to things to do. So we want to highlight different things that um, visitors can do in New London and current residents. If you want to go down to explore a season, and then pull up summer. So we highlight New London as a place to visit year round. So different summer activities, whether that be boating and fishing. And then if you went into winter, you would see ice fishing, the kayaking. Um, if you go into fall, you'll see that you can visit Spooks on Spur, you can go golfing. So we're highlighting different things, different activities that, that people can enjoy during the different seasons. I'm gonna go back up, um, just pull up like the dining page. Yep, quick. So go down. So you don't have to be a chamber member to be part of this website. Any business in New London is highlighted and listed on here. So if you want to just go to fast food, it'll pull up all of our fast food on there. Oops, sorry. Each. Oh. Cooking too fast. Mm -hmm. You know, scroll down. Each business gets its own tile and um, destination information. And then if you want to go back up, same thing with lodging, the different lodging, um, go to camping and RV. We just did a ribbon cutting for um, Irish Acres Campground right in the middle there. So just highlighting the different things, different places to stay in New London. And then the last tab on there is just our directory, highlighting all of our businesses, churches, organizations, parks, and schools. So again, you don't have to be a chamber member to be listed on here. We want to highlight every single business and, and thing to do in New London. So we can click out of there. So India is constantly working on updating and maintaining that website when businesses change locations, new businesses come out, new businesses go out. She's constantly making sure that those directories are, are listed and up to date and our, our dining and uh, retail information is all up to date and ready to go. So our recruiting efforts under there, it says Sturgeon, you can barely see it. Um, we invite thousands of people into New London through a, um, a call notification and email notification every year. Um, India also works with Discover Wisconsin and Travel Wisconsin, and we highlight all of our really large tourism events. So Irish Fest, Fall Fest, uh, the car show that's happening in June. She contacts Discover Wisconsin and Travel Wisconsin to make sure that New London is on the map and is listed in their calendars so that people are aware of those events that are happening in New London. Uh, we also highlight the murals. We've created leave behind cards. We have people from Appleton, the Fox Cities, always coming and asking about our murals ever since we made the news. So we created a little um, Google form where they can just uh, scan that uh, QR code and it takes it right to Google and they're able to go and visit murals in New London. And then if you could pull up the tourism guide real quick. So the tourism guide is also written by the chamber, but it's a tourism effort, a way to highlight New London. And we print off about 7,500 of these. We work with um, the Press Star they sell the ads, we write the book, um, but this is just another way to showcase New London. And these don't just circulate in New London. So 7,500 copies are printed and we are shipping them off to different chambers, different visitor bureaus all throughout Wisconsin to make sure that everybody in the state of Wisconsin knows what's happening in New London. There's an attraction page that we created. It's four to five different <clears throat> pages that just list all the different things that are happening in our area. And then these are perfect um, resource guides. If someone moves to New London, all the different um, resource information is listed in there as well. Stop share there. Go back. Yep. And then lastly, the tourism center. So the front part of the chamber, if you've ever been in there, that area is open 24 seven to the public and it's just filled with um, different resource information. Did I do that? Nope, I did that. It's right. got maps, resources. Um, it's got every county guide that you can think of, um, but it's that one-stop resource tourism hub for the community. So then there is the tourism commission, which is, which is separate from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, five commissioners are appointed by the mayor of New London. Uh, according to the state statute, we have to be have someone from um, a hotel on that commission. So we have the owner of um, American on that um, commission base. And our job is to, there's room tax that's collected by the city. 6% of room tax is collected. The city keeps a percentage. And then the tourism commission um, 
meets based on applications and our goal is to dis distribute that those funds um, to different nonprofits to support putting heads in beds, bringing people in our community, making sure people are stopping in our gas stations, going to our restaurants and eating and checking out our, our shopping facilities. So the room tax dollars um, that are sponsored by tourism support um, advertising for nonprofits. So this is a list of just some of the different, I think it's cut off on the bottom. I apologize, this is kind of all wacky, but these are just kind of some of the events that the Tourism Commission has funded. Irish Fest is obviously huge, Fall Fest and Wheels on Water Street, but our, our goal is to put heads in beds. That's in the state statute that we wanna make sure that we are bringing, that these funds <coughs> should be bringing people into our community to spend money. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I'm what happened? I, think I, if, I used a new format to do a PowerPoint, and I think his computer is just not. Well, if you use a font that's not native on this computer, it yep. doesn't know how to use that font. Everything is shifted and all funny. It there. looked really cute, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but any questions about um, tourism efforts in the city of New London that I can answer? I was just wondering, you say you ship off those books to other chambers. Do we advertise for other chambers as well yep so there's a list of chambers uh india keeps her job her a big part of her job in january is contacting <clears throat> surrounding chambers to see who wants books and what books we should be advertising so she's constantly she's getting feedback from people who are stopping in saying hey do you have anything for claire or <clears throat> or whatnot so she's keeping those memos of what people are looking for and uh we're carrying their books as well so if somebody wanted to take a vacation to Eau Claire, they could come down to the chamber and get a book up right. there. Yeah. And just depending on, you know, sometimes people, and most of, most of the people stop in and they want to, you know, go to Door County or the, the tourism area. So just based on what, what people are asking for. I, I might've missed this, but what's the coordination or alignment between the two groups? Um, <coughs> I, well, they're separate. Uh, the commission is is an actual city ordinance um, and a state statute. Um, I guess the only thing that would tie the two together is me because I'm the secretary on the tourism commission. But so, then, so there's not like there's the an annual funding, meeting between the no, two. No, the funding is to make sure. No, there's no funding that is tied to it, or it's it's separate. Well, I guess I meant more along the lines of like, hey, you guys spend your dollars on this we'll spend our dollars on this, then we know we're covering all of our bases. So the chamber's not spending dollars, we're, we're advertising and advocating, I guess. So the Tourism Commission is more, they, they get these funds and they're trying to decide how to disperse them. Our tourism underneath the umbrella of the chamber is more just to how to advertise. And I would have to interject here that we're very fortunate with, with April the way she runs that stuff and, and it melts together very well. Is it fair to say that we're almost, or the tourism commission's almost contracting out with the chamber to be Correct. the tourism entity for the city? Am I able to click? I feel like I missed a slide. There was a- So money from the commission goes to the chamber? Some for payroll to pay for that tourism employee. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is kind of like a, a contract base if you think of it that way. But, but they're very separate in what their duties and expectations are. Um, the commission funds these events. Um, they, we've also done the, um, the billboard out on 45, but they also said, why don't we have something out on the Sturgeon Trail? So I missed this part, I apologize. Um, and they said they um, tasked India to create this tourism sign that we just put out on the Sturgeon Trail. We partnered with um, the county and they approved um, this, I think it's eight, or 11 by 17 sign that's out on the um, Sturgeon Trail right now. So when people come to visit the Sturgeon, they can scan that QR code and that takes them back to the tourism website, which it has all the dining and the restaurants and, and shopping opportunities. And I can foresee this growing in other areas that these signs could go up to promote the website to kind of get people grown to. Have you seen an uh, uptick in bike rentals now that the Blackmore Trail is 
brought into town? So they come out after Memorial Weekend, so we haven't seen them yet this year. Okay. Um, so maybe we'll have some more. Maybe you want to promote that this year just because the trail is... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> when we put the bikes out there, we always put a list of all the bike trails and a QR code, so that'll definitely be promoted. Ginger and I are working right now to find, see if there's a better location for the bikes so that they're not sitting in the heat. So they might go a little bit later this year than normal. I have a question about the trail. I feel like we're going a bit field, but on the map for the trail, there seems to be a portion that crosses the river. And I tried to go find it the other day and there doesn't seem to be any portion that crosses the river. So I, it feels like our map is incorrect. Correct. So that's the goal. We got to get across the Embarrass River someday. Um, our, our initial hope was that the development project that we just completed would go all the way. We had some challenges with trying to figure out a way to get across the river that would be compliant with um, FEMA and the DNR. And we just kind of ran out of time because this was grant money and we only had so much time to use it. So we didn't have enough time to keep on going with that investigation. So we just, we cut it off right there just to use the grant funding that we had within the deadline, get that part done. And now the next phase is going to be, we need to get over the embarrassed river. So um, Ginger's working on that. She's actually um, writing a grant with Wapaka County to help us with the investigation phase of that. But there's, there's obviously challenges with wetlands and bridges with the DNR and, and FEMA and things like that, that we got to overcome, but trails are made in segments. So this, that was a huge segment to get it in the city limits. So now we got another segment that we got to get over to connect it into the current trail system. I, th I think it's great what we have. I just don't want anybody riding into the river. Thinking <laughs> <that there's... laughs> yep. Just kidding. Does anybody else have any questions for April for the presentation? Thank you for listening. Thank you. Moving on, we'll have a discussion about placemaking. <clears throat> I think Hans, you know, yeah, that one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I had intended to have a PowerPoint program and I just ran out of time. So um, we do have some visuals that we will be able to use, but basically I just wanted to talk about what placemaking is, maybe focus, a, and I, I know the, the, um, the purpose of our group is economic development, but there are other, um, reasons why you might pursue placemaking um, that are in order to sort of foster cultural or social ties between members of the community. So placemaking, um, the literature that I have describes placemaking as inspiring people to collectively reimagine and reinvent public spaces as the heart of every community. Uh, it's more than just promoting better urban design Placemaking facilitates creative patterns of use, paying particular attention to the physical, cultural, and social identities that it defines a place and supports its ongoing evolution. So I don't know if everybody had a chance to, I mean, there was a lot that was in this packet that went out, but if you got a chance to look at it, the idea is to kind of create a place that people want to be. And um, that can be for a very long, I mean, look at it as like a permanent type thing, a project that is going to be lasting, or it can be a temporary, extremely temporary, one day only event. Um, and it can be anything in between. It can have a lasting impact. It can be just a, uh, very short sort of ephemeral impact. Um, the purposes of it are very wide. Uh, I thought about it in the context of the uh, street work that we are gonna be doing over the next couple of years and um, the opportunities that might come out of that for placemaking. One of the things that is uh, not necessarily touched on a lot in this particular presentation that we received from the WEDC is 
um, this concept of lighter, quicker, cheaper, um, which is a way of doing place keep or place making that is meant to be cost effective. It's meant to be community driven and not necessarily coming from the, the uh, governmental entity that uh, or the municipality that it's found in, um, but it's supposed to be kind of a grassroots, um, relatively inexpensive thing, and uh, it can be used for any period of time. And so I've got some examples of when we're looking at lighter, quicker, cheaper, what it what it can mean. Um, so. For example, I'll give you the definition too. It's a phrase that's uh, used to describe simple short-term and low-cost solutions when trying to look at placemaking. And so the reasons you might use a lighter, quicker, cheaper approach are to bring life and amenities to previously lifeless public spaces, generate the interest of potential investors, both public and private, establish or reestablish a neighborhood or a region's sense of community, inform best practices for later planning efforts, encourage community buy-in by demonstrating, for example, how a new street design would impact traffic flows, not only for cars, but also for pedestrians, cyclists, and public transit to foster a community sense of pride in and ownership of their public spaces. So for example, in uh, Louisville, a few years ago, uh, there was a lighter, quicker, cheaper project, placemaking project where they temporarily transformed a 16,000 square foot vacant downtown lot into a pop-up beer garden, cafe and outdoor space. It went from Thursday to Sunday, from September 19th to October 25th. So basically four days a week for five days, a total of 20 days. Um, the lot became an all day event site and public destination with business people flocking to food trucks for lunch, young people swarming to see local bands, DJs and poetry slams in the evening and families and couple arriving for outdoor movies and table tennis at night. You just, take a space and transform it for a short period of time. Um, so hopefully you can get uh, businesses interested in participating in it. You can get community members interested in participating in it. And there's, it's, it's just a relatively low cost uh, way of getting into it. And hopefully you'll have things that come out of it as well. Um, lighter Quicker, cheaper projects allow for communities to experiment with short-term pilot projects before investing in larger, more permanent public space alterations. They generate creative participation in the community, and they can also invite new sources of funding for the future of a project. I, I think the mural project is a really good example of a lighter, quicker, cheaper um, idea that then became much bigger and it started with let's just have some blocks on the side of the building right and it grew from that um, lighter quicker cheaper projects can also be used to sometimes be self-supporting um, there is an example of a i think it was in new zealand where there was an earthquake in 2010 there was an earthquake and there were there was like a lot of destruction in vacant lots. And then coming out of that, um, a group created a, they call it a jukebox uh, out of an old fashioned washing machine an MP3 player. And they had some speakers and they set up kind of a makeshift stage. And um, basically anybody from the public could just come and like request or play songs for $2. And so it generated a bunch of money on its own and it kind of turned into like a small dance party. Um, they, it ultimately supplied over 600 hours of entertainment in the first three months of operation. And there was almost like seven hours per day that they calculated that there was music going and people down there experiencing it. And it cost virtually nothing to do uh, and it supported itself. 
So I, I just kind of wanted to introduce the concept of placemaking to the group. And then I had a few ideas uh, for things that we could do. We could do all of them, we could do none of them or pick one or whatever. But so um, during the street project, I was thinking, well, usually our downtown is the focal point of the community in terms of people like gathering on say a Friday night or Saturday night. Um, maybe we could do neighborhood block parties. We could do like through the course of a summer uh, or through the course of a season or maybe over two years, we would do seven or eight neighborhood block parties where you would get people from a neighborhood to help host it, drive awareness, find activities for people to do, and then to basically put it on. Uh, it would be a great way to take a little bit of pressure off of downtown, but also offer something for people to do and foster a sense of community and pride in that particular neighborhood. We could create an alternative or temporary focal point. Um, maybe instead of hosting a bunch of things on North Water Street, like we usually do, we pick a park like Riverside Park or Hatton Park, and we start using that park as our focal point for the year and try to do as much stuff as we can in that particular place. I just use Riverside Park because I think it's, it's beautiful. I think it's also really underused. I drive by it all the time and I very rarely see people in it and it's a gem right along the river. Um, I think we could hold a bunch of events down there. I think also between all of these different ideas, there's an opportunity to support the businesses that are going to be impacted by the project, right? So if we're gonna have block parties, let's give Jolly Rogers, El Tequila, whoever else, Familiar Ground, be there, be present, have um, a way to generate income for themselves, and also for the community to help them if they're difficult to get to. I was talking to the folks that are uh, that run Familiar Grounds not that long ago, and it sounds like they're going to be, at least for a period of time, really impacted by this project. And I, I frankly wasn't aware of that, that it was going to be going in that direction. Um, and they're nervous about it. So maybe there's a way for them to still have a presence in the rest of the community uh, and for us to help them. I, I don't know where to go from here. Um, if there's a group that's interested in taking this on and running with it, uh, I, I'm not really sure that it's our job to be doing this. The idea behind placemaking is for it to be sort of a community driven effort. Frankly, like the mural project, we supported it, but there was a different group that took it on. Um, I don't know if maybe between the members here, we can think of some people that might be interested in spearheading something like this. Uh, I think it's an opportunity to benefit the community. Uh, oh, then the last one I had, I, I, so I wanted to do like short-term one day things, right? Block parties, longer term, sort of create an alternative focal point. Um, and then I wanted to offer the third idea of like a permanent project that would be a really nice community thing to do would be something along the lines of, can we raise money for, and then as a community construct a park out somewhere on the north side of the city, because there is property owned by the city out there. And right now, if you are a family that lives Anywhere out there, the closest park for you is Pfeiffer Park, and you have to cross a major highway to get there. And it's just not conducive for kids to be able to go play at a park. So, I mean, maybe there's a placemaking opportunity there through events or something to be able to fund and build that park.
So those are my three options. Very nice, thank you. Thank you, Hans. Is there any questions? I have a question, I think more, more of a comment. I think placemaking needs to be on the agenda for the revitalization subcommittee because this is something that we focus on um, and it's part of our mission and vision. When you're talking about places where people want to be, my mind immediately went to, do you remember a few months ago when you brought up that mock-up of the boardwalk downtown? Where are we at on that? The boardwalk. Mm -hmm. um, I think you had like a design drawn up of- Oh, he's talking about the technical assistance. Earlier. Are you talking about oh, the this? one that went over the river? I think yeah, so, yeah. Over, yes. <laughs> Hans was talking and it was just like, oh, where's that file? So I found the file quick. So this was the one of the things that, if you recall, we had a technical assistance grant with the Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission, and they brought in Ayers, a couple um, engineers from Ayers, and that was that one day program. We talked about the back alley, and this was that concept that they kind of came up with um, for the back alley. First of all, flipping St. John's Park somehow, instead of having the in and out for parking solely on North Water Street, have some type of drive through through here. Also bringing the park up to the street. Right now the parking lot cuts the park off. You don't even kind of, you miss it if, if you're driving by. So this would bring an opportunity of bringing the park up to the street creating maybe a placemaking opportunity. And then obviously the boardwalk um, back here. Um, I did send a message, I believe to MSA, who was the engineering firm who we hired I think in 2018 to do all the repairs to the river wall. And I asked them, I thought they would be the firm to kind of reach out to first because they have all our data from survey data and the repairs and everything that we did for the wall. So the first question would be, you know, if we want to investigate some type of boardwalk on that river wall, is that wall in any type of condition to support that type of structure and then just kind of go from there. So um, I'll, I can reach out to MSA again and, you know, make sure that they're start that ball rolling, just kind of get some investigation type things. That's just where my mind went. And then too, I remembered um, thinking when you showed it to us originally, that gets kind of more use out of two parks too, because there's Taft Park with that beautiful memorial on it now, and St. John's too, which I think is underused. So, And for the downtown project, we've actually talked about, we, we might not do it initially, but we might be setting it up to do something with this park. So um, for the design of the road right now, we've actually, and, and think about this, but flipping it the other way, um, we've actually talked about having this as the in and out entrance blocking in this entrance, not or not having an exit here. And then this parking would actually be on this side. Hypothetically, well, stage one would be just putting um, the entrance and exit here and leaving the parking is, but maybe doing the diagonal parking right off the bat, just to set up the road for the project. So here's what it looks like today. So hypothetically, keep this entrance here, block this off, put straight on parking throughout here we might have to pull this away but that sets us up that we're blocking off this exit for more parking on the road but then that would set us up that this could be our in and out coming to the alley and our parking throughout here that's my turnaround spot when i don't want to parallel park <laughs> You'd have to come in and come back out. I'm just joking. It would be huge for the people for the people that use the alley. That extra way out would be huge. But the reason why we flipped it and put the parking on this side is because of the trash locations here, and that already has a uh, sanitary sewer pipe that runs to a sanitary sewer system. So, if we would flip it and do this scenario, then you're moving the central collection dumpsters over somewhere. Whereas if we're coming over here, we could leave that there and then hypothetically use this whole area as your new place making. I think, um, I think this is a major pipe dream. Uh, it, we're talking millions of dollars for a boardwalk. It's just not even feasible. 
Um, I like all that Han said. My brain went right to between John's bar and um, longevity. Mm -hmm. There's that space there. Um, I know the Wolf River Art League has a little community garden behind uh, the antique place. Maybe they'd be want, interested in moving it there, put a little walkway in between there with some benches and some kind, maybe some, um, I know they have their Edison bulbs, river lighting, you know, behind uh, the Water Street Vintage. Maybe they want to move there. I don't know. Do we own that property? I think this area is another destination. I think Tim's right on the right um, aspect, depending on how we own this lot right here. The city does. We own in between St. John's, John's Bar and Longevity right now, there's actually three lots, 207, 205, and 203. We own 203 and 205. Um, John's Bar owns 207 and 211. And then we own all this property too. So you know, we have this property to kind of set up for potential development after the Swiderski project gets going. So what, what can we do in this whole area, you know, for a, maybe a private development plus public improvements in here for placemaking? I think this is another destination um, av or opportunity like the St. John's on North Water Street. Well, and I mean, part of the idea behind placemaking is at least on the lighter, quicker, cheaper end of the spectrum, that you are not fully committing a particular area to be used for something in perpetuity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could set up an outdoor beer garden slash cafe slash outdoor garden. I mean, you could do all of that there. <coughs> and then in 10 or 15 years, when a development opportunity comes along, you just move that someplace else and it should be fairly easy to do. So I guess um, you say there is a subcommittee for the downtown revitalization. Do we wanna reach out to them to, and kind of, well, the, hey, we're looking at doing this. Do they wanna take that on? We received the um, placemaking information from the Connect Communities um, program. So I forwarded it to him because I knew Hans had uh, mentioned placemaking. It was already on our radar, um, but I don't see why it can't be on our on our agenda. Otherwise, I guess I was going to suggest, do we uh, is there enough interest in this? Would anybody be interested in <clears throat> starting another subcommittee to meet to discuss some of these ideas to move it forward? If we did a subcommittee, it feels to me like it should consist of mostly community members, you know. You want it to be somewhat of a grassroots thing that we can help with, but that we're not necessarily driving it. I mean, I guess, except to the extent that it's, if we're gonna do it on city property, I mean, then, then a lot of participation but i mean it doesn't even necessarily have to be on city property i mean that's obviously the easiest way to do it but if somebody else has a space that they're willing to allow us to use for a period of time that's fine too so i mean i guess i would be willing to to serve on it but i think we should find some other people that are willing to do it what what it seems to me like we really need some people that want to put some work in and have an event um you know back in the early 2000s there was a sesquicentennial committee and they brought in lumberjacks and they brought in um they did that behind old city hall they brought in a trolley and gave rides they had like a week long of stuff and out of that sesquicentennial committee, they said, well, what are we going to do on the actual fourth? And fourth fell on a Wednesday. And they were like, well, we'll just take the day off. We won't have any events that day. And a couple of people said, well, we should have something. So we came up with this flat, flat bottom boat race at Riverside Park with a polka band. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I mean, it was packed. 
of people showing up in, in 2001, I think it was. And then out of that, for the next 10 years, Wolf River Sturgeon Trail Committee, uh, UW Extension, all these people, Tom King caught a bunch of frogs and they had frog jumping, watermelon seed spitting. The place was packed. The utility brought power down to Riverside Park. The people were like, well, we never knew this park was here. The DNR brought in that aquarium that plugged into the city garage. And it really was a prime example of a placemaking thing. But after 10 years, you know, it ran its course. Well, yeah, you run out of young helpers to do things and volunteers and then Ginger kind of saved it and Ted Christian and Hatton Stadium. There was talk about what's going to happen with Hatton Stadium and it was a perfect segue to go, well, let's move it from this park because the federal government didn't like the fireworks being shot off next to the treatment plant, <laughs> which is understandable. <laughs> and so they moved the fireworks up to Hatton Stadium and, and it became a new good thing there. And a one, you know, a simpler to, to put on, but still draws a huge, massive amount of crowd, which you could is kind of a placemaking event in itself. What what goes on on the fourth of July last year, things got wet and damp, and that nobody can control that, but it draws a lot of people in, you know, that fireworks. But you could dovetail or segue off of events like that, you know, and really what the youth baseball groups do for town too is you know some coordination could could really easily be done to really make make it happen you just got to have the people willing to step up and you know <laughs> poor tim you know yesterday probably had blisters on his feet with um some of the special activities that went on in new london for memorial day and and you know there's there needs to be Volunteers willing to put on something like that, put their put their shirt out on the line and do it. Um, I guess what we can do is try to always try to eliminate red tape, but if it's on city property, there has to be insurance. There has to be, it's not like the days where you can just hand over the key to the to the umpire shed and say, sure, go have a home run derby. You can't do that, you know. You got to have insurance. And Hans was kind of coming in with this in his mind. We probably aren't as far along in the thought process. I mean, we might have to, you know, just think of think of this for a little bit and retable it because I know I'm much many steps behind what what Hans is thinking and and you know, but I think there's a lot of good ideas. I, I think the red tape um, elimination for I don't know how we go about doing it, but when downtown is affected, if we if we allow, we mentioned El Tequilas and Jolly Rogers and some of those establishments to maybe have, I don't know, a food truck or something. If, if, um, if, uh, you know, familiar grounds is going to affect it, that allow them guys some, some flexibility to have a location off site for a period of time that really helps them keep their business. I don't know if that fits in there or not. I just know that I learned a lot in a little bit and I don't even maybe <coughs> think about it for a little bit and then, next agenda maybe i don't know absolutely i think we should uh keep this on the agenda for next month everybody go home and think about it maybe you can do some research on placemaking and um you know at that time maybe we could form a subcommittee to meet and you know encourage uh you know the community to volunteer and get together for a block party or um i went to that uh, may festival uh, that was awesome. Uh, you know, that was put on, I don't remember what, what kind of group put that on, but, uh, you know, you're right. You got to have some kind of group that's willing to take that on. But if we had maybe a subcommittee that could encourage, make some phone calls and say, Hey, you know, I know we used to have a, a music festival at Hatton park back in the day, you know, maybe we could, you know, reach out and kind of spur some enthusiasm about it, um, and not do it per se, as a subcommittee, but encourage other organizations to take something up like that, so. Well, and you just talked about um, encouraging more events or supporting the ones we have. I mean, the chamber does the uh, music 
on Thursday nights um, in the park several times a year. That that just blows up in my mind as a placemaking event where you just put an event out there, you play some music and have a Lions Club come in and, and do the thing. So, I mean, it's already happening a little bit, but if we can promote it more and expand on it, good stuff. Is there any other uh, discussion on that? Any comments, questions for Hans? Otherwise, we'll uh, move along to uh, business updates from April. All right. Um, I've been told there's an active offer on Hilby's building and business. And Terry's working with someone. Um, there's also an active offer on the building at MK Flooring, not the business. It sounds like just uh, an investor is coming in. Uh, GFL, formerly known as Gratian, sanitation stopped in and they are working on an expansion. So a ribbon cutting will be happening for them soon. Kurt Dahl has the development that's happening on Shawano Street. It looks like he broke ground. He'll be doing six to seven units. Um, he's working with headhunters to bring some new business into town. Um, the building at 102 East Cook Street, which is formerly the pad, it's currently being used as storage. Shiler did have um, a business there. He expanded into Appleton and closed his new one in store. His lease ends at the end of this month. So we're working with a couple of people who are interested in that building. Chad and I got out to visit some businesses uh, last week, stopped in um, at Amazing Low Prices, Boss Mam Aesthetics, Innovative Staffing, The Lily Pad. We stopped in and talked with every business at the commercial building on the Opaca Street. I call it the Raggy Rome building. Um, and then we stopped in at Sherwood Automotive, um, formerly uh, Coils Tire. Um, and then American Family Insurance, which was Rhonda Olson Insurance out on Shano Street, has a new agent, Barb Nelson. She'll be having a rib cu ribbon cutting to welcome her to town on June 2nd at 12 p.m. So everyone is invited. Any questions? What's going in on the little strip mall there by Subway? Do That's you know the Kurt Dahl expansion. I don't think all the contracts are signed yet, so I don't think everything is public yet. So he's working with some headhunters to bring in some long-term leases. So we'll know more soon. Uh, we'll move along to city administrator report, Chad. Yep, um, just two quick things. Um, as most of you heard and know, uh, SC Swiderski has signed the developer's agreement. Maybe the ones that aren't on the council um, may not know that yet, but. Um, they did sign the developer's agreement for the riverfront development. Um, we're, we are going to complete the utility relocate first. So the excavators that you see on site right now is part of the city's project to move the utility uh, to the north um, or move the sanitary sewer to the north and then put a new water line to the south uh, to make room for their project. Um, we plan on having that done in by late July, and then we'll be closing on the project or closing on the property with SC Swiderski by late July as well. Um, in their developer's agreement, it does state that they're gonna start their, their um, project in the fall, but I anticipate that to be a lot of site fill um, work that they need to do for the foundation. Um, and as indicated in the developer's agreement, the project completion um, they've agreed upon is by July, 2025. So it is a very large project. It's not gonna happen within a year. Um, it's gonna take over a year to complete, um, but they should be starting their work in the fall. And then April already talked about uh, going through the downtown and popping in and saying, hi, dropping off business cards. So that's all I got. Any questions for Chad? Thank you. Uh, move on to review potential agenda items uh, for future meetings. I think we'll bring back the placemaking. Uh, maybe discuss that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone else have anything that they'd like to talk about? Okay, so our next uh, meeting date would be? Next regular one would be on Tuesday, June 27th. Look for a motion to adjourn. So, second. Got a motion by Hans, second by Bill for 